afternoon. Today I'm so happy to welcome back our sisters and associates and our friends for the second of our Emerging Ideas series, and uh, which has now been translated and it's called Currents for Hope and Grace, for What Do You Yearn? I'm also wel happy to uh, welcome two friends, Angie and Casper, who are millennials, and I want to define millennials because some of you don't know what that means, but millennials are our younger generation, roughly between the ages of 25 and 40. And as many of us know, the millennials today are less religiously affirmed to organized religions. However, due to the internet and social media, millennials are now flocking to those sites that host organizations to speak about community, about social and personal transformation, about accountability, and about spiritual formation. In view of that, our friends Angie and Kafsper have picked up and are following through to try to help these millennials who are obviously searching. I first met Angie and Kasper in 2016 at their first gathering for 100 millennials at Yale Divinity School. They hosted this gathering to speak and listen to their young friends who were searching for things of the heart, inner wisdom and growth. This meeting was a huge success and the people wanted more. So a year later, a year later in 2017, in response to the request from these friends, Angie and Casper hosted a second gathering of 125 millennials, this time with adult wisdom figures who could share about their lives and experience with many of the inner, more spiritual questions. This meeting led the young people to ask Angie and Casper for something further. So at their request, our young colleagues organized what they called inner spirit or spiritual accompaniment. That is one-on-one, -on -one, one millennial and one elder for twice monthly meetings on the internet to pursue the personal and pressing questions of the young who could then listen to the life experience of the elder. This also was a very wonderful success for very many millennials and elders. And uh, so the, the millennials kept moving and kept pushing Angie and Casper asking for more. Just this month, the month of October has seen the conclusion of a year of spiritual formation written and led by Angie and Casper for more than 40 young millennials. I'm going to talk more about this in a moment, but just to go on with the background, Krista Tippett, who spoke to us last month, hired Angie and Casper at her On Being Lab in Minneapolis, and they worked for Krista for one year. Finally, just this last week, Angie and Casper with their new partner, Sue Phillips, launched their own enterprise entitled Sacred Designs for Belonging, Becoming, and Beyond. Let's move now to hear first a bit about Angie's story, and then we'll ask her experience responding to the younger generation's yearnings for currents of grace and ways in which they're now hoping to respond. So Angie, I'm going to ask you if you could share a bit about your background and your interest in things spiritual that led you to Harvard Divinity School, and also your initial meeting with Casper and how you two began to share mutual aspirations. I would love to, and it is such a joy to be here, to be here with you, Sue, and the others who are watching and, and um, just full of gratitude for the chance to discuss these things. So a little bit of my background, I grew up in Boulder, Colorado. My mother's family is Jewish and my father's family is nominally Protestant, but both of my parents had grown up in homes where religion was more of a social or political category than something of um, a, a place to experience spiritual fruit. And both of my parents were, prototypical spiritual seekers. So they met each other in San Francisco in the 70s and they encountered a text called the Urantia book that's not familiar to most people, but it's sort of a textbook on the universe that talks about 
science, philosophy, religion, and has 700 pages about Jesus in it. So I was raised, along with my two siblings, um, learning from the teachings of this book and learning to develop a relationship with God and to follow the inspiration of Jesus. But I was raised outside of the church and I was also raised without an organized religion at all. So I think that positioned me in an unusual way to be very receptive to the possibility that someone could be both religiously unaffiliated as I was and also very religious in their motivations and in their orientation toward life. I was motivated from a very young age by the premise of growing closer to God and more useful to others in my day-to-day -day life. Um, the idea of living love was one that appealed to me a great deal. So it wasn't until I was in my, um, in my early to mid twenties that this came to a head a little bit. I was living in Brooklyn, New York. I had studied playwriting in college and I was friends with lots of artsy people. And I kept finding that the ceiling on the conversation was too low. I wanted to be talking about you know, I was with all these creative people, right? And ostensibly creativity is part of what allows us to, um, to create new things as a culture. And so I kind of thought, hey, here in our artistic community, why don't we think about how we might move toward these higher ideals um, than we've yet been able to manifest in the society we've created. But often I found that the conversation stopped a little bit lower than that. It was more like, how do we lay bare the wounds of our time and jar the audience out of its complacency, which is part of the story. Uh, but I wanted to know where are the people who are helping to, to create that world that we long to see. And so it wasn't until I had a roommate who happened to go to Harvard Divinity School to study art, like religious relics. It was like a totally different track. But that was the first time I even heard of Divinity School. I had never even known that there was a place you could go to study for things like ministry, nor did I ever even consider the notion of using a word like ministry to describe myself. And so I started to learn about this as, um, as a category, I guess. And I also started to, to look around in my own life for where are my peers going to find meaningful experiences of belonging? Because I'm, I'm craving that and I get the sense that others might be as well. And it was in that inquiry that I learned that I was an unaffiliated millennial. That was new language to me. I hadn't come out you know, knowing that language to describe myself. But the more that I looked into it from my own personal um, curiosity, the more that I started to learn about these trends that were happening nationwide of, you know, as of, as of now, it's now 40% of people in the millennial generation are unaffiliated. Back then it was something like 33. So it's, that was about six years ago. Um, so it's, you know, a kind of staggering percentage of this generation. And when you get even younger to Gen Z, it's even higher. So I was like, all right, I, I don't really believe a hypothesis that we're all just non-belongers with commitment issues and no spiritual inklings at all, right? There has to be something going on that would meet the needs of the soul that continue, um, even if the shape that religious life is taking um, might change. So that was really what led me to the inquiry that brought me to divinity school. And I had the great good fortune of meeting Casper Turkile in my very first week in my very first course, we were required to take intro to ministry studies. And luckily we were in the same seminar and we each shared our spiritual autobiographies. And after his, I basically pounced on him and said, we have to work together. Uh, and he was gracious enough not to call me crazy <laughs> and to actually entertain a, a conversation over coffee. And we've basically been working together ever since. That is so beautiful. Oh, that's so beautiful. Thank you. And I didn't know a lot of that, so I'm very, very <laughs> grateful to hear it. Uh, and I I'm just want to turn a minute to the, to the people who are listening, because uh, today we had a bit of a glitch in our plans. Casper, who was traveling from New York to Chicago, was caught in a snowstorm or in some kind of a delay and is unable to join us on the call. So I'm going to ask the questions that I was going to ask Casper. I'm going to ask them to Angie and she'll do the best to, to respond to them. But we, we've just learned of this in the last hour or so. So uh, it's been a bit of a glitch. However, uh, Angie has all the answers I know. So I'll come back to you now, Angie. And I was going to ask Casper that same question and I don't know 
how much you can tell us, but maybe just a little bit too about uh, his interest in questions of the spirit and what called him to sort of begin working with people of his generation, because you've been now together for the last many years. Absolutely. Yeah. So Casper and I have now been working together six years. So I think I've, I've learned enough of his story that I can at least <laughs> impart a little bit of it. Uh, so Casper grew up in the United Kingdom, um, but his parents are Dutch. So he had a strong uh, Dutch cultural upbringing within the UK. And he was raised in a secular context. You know, the UK is something like 93% secular. Um, but he was raised in a home that had a great deal of ritual. And so they would sing to the animals around Christmas time. And his mother ran an Airbnb out of their home, and or not an Airbnb, a bed and breakfast out of their home. And so there were always people coming in and out and they would sing a song at dinner every night and welcome whoever had come. You know, there are these things like that in his home, even though he never would have um, been raised to call them religious or to have any reference point to religious life, even though he had a pretty robust ritual life in his family. And Casper became a climate activist from a young age and he had gone to boarding school and, and he came out um, in high school and he was very poorly received by the, the religious institution of, that ran the school. And so he had a pretty strong reaction against religion at that time um, and sort of took out his anger t at the man on trying to address the climate crisis. And you know, he ended up having a very bitter disappointment um, leading up to one of the climate, uh, kind of one of the large climate convenings he and his fellow activists had really taken it to heart and they thought they were gonna make a big difference in the decision that came out of this accord and it didn't, it didn't affect the decision. And so he was really crushed in his, I think, early 20s at this point and he didn't know where to look. And so he ended up um, going to, to Harvard to go to the Kennedy School to get a public policy degree because he was like, well, you know, <laughs> when you don't know what to do, go get more education. And so he was there doing, doing a public policy degree and he kept meeting these people from the Divinity School. And he had no idea, like me, he had no idea what Divinity School was. He thought it was a place actually where you train Catholic priests. That was as close as he came to having a sense of it. Uh, but then when he met our friend Erica, who's a Latina lesbian Buddhist, he was like, wait a second, you go to divinity school? What is this place? And, you know, he had really been affected by that time by learning about some of the way that social movements happened and the fact that it seemed like they were never, especially among the leaders of social change movements and the grounding behind them, that they were never too far from religion. And so he had started to wonder about religious practice and religious belief as connected to social change. And that became his avenue in. But like me, he was interested in what was happening at a macro level. What are the ways that religion is changing, the way that society is changing? And you know, I think as we've worked together, we've, we've developed some common language and this has been in part because of getting to work with sisters where we might be asking ourselves now, how is spirit moving in the midst of these changes? That's wonderful. Oh, I'm so grateful because I was worried that we wouldn't get his background as well. And, and so thank you very, very much, Angie. You're wonderful to do that. And I'd really love to give the whole history of my friendship with you and our relationship and how we've worked together. But because of our limitations, I want to now focus in on your latest project that has just completed in October. And that was the formation project. Uh, I understand from the meetings that you had with young people from those years of being of accompanying people and of working with them and trying to support them that you heard from them this desire to have some kind of formation for the inner life for the heart for those aspects that are not taught in schools so how do i look at my fear how do i grow how do i become who i'm supposed to be and it was out of that desire on the part of people to have some kind of formation in that area of their lives that you and Casper sat down and wrote and planned a one-year formation project, which you yourself entered into and followed. 
And that started last year on October the 15th. It was completed this year on October the 15th. And I'm so curious, and I'm sure others are too, to hear, uh, first of all, I think, just give us an overall of that. But we want to know your personal experience of going through that process. And then there's one little last question because we're listening because we're interested, but we'd also love to support you, but we don't know how. So if you could just take us through, give us a bit of the idea of what the Formation Project was, and then basically what's your experience and what you're hearing from others, what's happened and where is this leading? And then is there some support for, for, for you from us? All right. Well, I'll start by setting the scene as a former playwright. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, here you have all of these young people who are, in a sense, cobbling together a spiritual life, right? So uh, people are still people. So our, our hunger for connection, right? Connection to our authentic selves, connection to others, connection to this earth that we share, and connection to something more than ourselves. These, these hungers have not gone anywhere. And yet the, the forms of religious life have changed and the way that people are meeting these needs has changed. And in many cases, they're really struggling to meet these needs. And, and to be clear, it's not just about um, their needs for their own edification, right? This has to do with how, how are people coming into experiences and relationships that allow them to both receive and give experiences of being deeply known and deeply loved and contributing to this greater something we're part of, right? So finding that people were bereft in this area and longing for more was what led us to create the Formation Project and to create it certainly to serve our peers no matter who they were, but also and maybe especially to serve people who had found themselves in positions of community leadership. Because some of what's happened is that for folks who are either unaffiliated religiously or where they might be drawing from multiple streams in their religious lives, they often um, find themselves without a clear cut community or identity where they can go to bring the questions of ultimate meaning and value in their lives. And so part of what that can lead to is that people who are running things like fitness communities or arts communities or communities around justice movements or communities around other topics like grief and loss or um, you know, even communities that form around people being fans of different things like Harry Potter or other, you know, other stories. These communities end up being sometimes the only location where young people have to go where they feel they belong. And so lo and behold, they're showing up in those communities and treating the leaders of those communities like pastors because they're bringing their whole lives into those spaces, whether they mean to or not. And so Casper and I, along with our colleague Sue, had been gathering the leaders of those communities who were feeling that they were suddenly responsible in, in at least some way for the care of the souls of the people that were coming to their doorstep. And so they were asking things like, how do I deepen my own well so that I can go deep with the people in my care? And lo and behold, here Casper and I were getting divinity school degrees, learning the arts of ministry. And when these folks found out the word formation, the idea that you could actually grow into both a sense of, of deep personal um, spiritual growth as well as spiritual leadership capacity. You know, the first time that Sue said that to a room full of these innovators, there were tears in their eyes because they didn't know there was a word for that, much less that thousands of years had been spent with people actually putting attention and effort toward those very things. So the Formation Project really tried to bring the work of formation to a group of young people who came from across religious backgrounds and some outside of religious um, identity or community altogether, and that also served people across geography. So we had folks involved in it who were all over the United States and seven out of the 40 participants who were in other countries. So even though the project was created in the US, um, we, we had the infrastructure online so that people could participate from all over. So those were some of the design challenges we had to contend with, was how do you build something that's gonna serve people where you can't rely on a shared religious story or identity 
and you can't rely on people being in the same place. So what did we do? We said, well, we better talk to the wisest people we know. We'll talk to Sue Mosteller and a few others who um, we got the, we had the privilege of meeting with. What, what was it, Sue? Maybe every six to eight weeks um, for about a year um, leading up to the creation of the formation project because we just wanted to know how does a novitiate work? How, what is charism? How does that, how, how is that related to your experience? What, tell us about vows. Tell us about commitment. Tell us about, um, you know, the way that you have experienced in yourself the discovery of gifts and have also experienced the opportunity to receive the gifts of others, right? All these kinds of questions. We just, you know, we didn't know, how does this happen? And um, so we, we, for, we spent a whole year learning from sisters and also learning from all kinds of different, what we've come to call containers for transformation. So if you think about the novitiate process as a container for transformation, right, where you're intentionally in a space that's created for that purpose, we, you know, we explored a lot of things. We explored even things like the army and the way that people go from an individualist culture to an honor culture where they're willing to die for the person next to them. How does that happen over time? Or we were interested in the way that it happens in some of these more secular spaces like, you know, the fitness communities we've gotten to know where people end up being transformed by the relationships that they form. So all that is to say, um, we basically tried to design a year long experience that would foster the transformation of the human heart and to build on the wisdom of our elders in doing it. And the experience that we had was certainly um, one of the most remarkable of my life. Uh, and I can, I can share a little bit of my personal experience and some of the elements that went into it, but I just wanna make sure, I'm gonna take a pause and see, because I've just been talking for a minute there. <laughs> this is perfect, just go on now with your, with your personal story. Okay. So it was, it was kind of a remarkable thing for me because of anyone on our team, I was really the one who, I guess, for whom this might be the closest thing to a call in my life. And um, I had the remarkable experience of architecting what we created while also participating in it as a, as a participant myself. And so, as you might imagine, uh, both sides of that coin were very uh, formational for me. Um, so we went through a journey. The first three months of the year was a discernment process. We had 56 people enter into discernment. And we really told, we said again and again that this was true discernment in the sense that and of course I recognize three months is absurdly short and a year long pilot is absurdly short for the kinds of transformation we're talking about. But we were just kind of testing whether some of these elements were effective. And so we really said this discernment is true in the sense that the call you're responding to is not from us, the project organizers, right? It is from whatever you put on your line. And this was one of the first creative conceits of the project. We said spiritual formation is you know, the intentional cultivation of disciplines and practices toward one clear goal, drawing nearer to blank. <laughs> and then we asked everyone to say, what's on your line, right? So for me, that, that was the word God. That's what that was for, for me, right? But people put everything from the divine feminine to Buddha nature, to Christ consciousness, to primordial awareness, uh, to love, to higher self, to, right? So people brought all kinds of language. Um, Hashem was one participant's word for the divine. And so we said, okay, this discernment, you're listening for the call of, of, of God, you know, or of whatever's on your line. And so if that aligns with this project, beautiful. And if not, then nothing could be more faithful than to follow your own call. So of those 56, 40 stayed, including me, and then another, um, and, and then we had group of facilitators. So we met in small groups for the following nine months. And those groups were facilitated by a, a very wise group of individuals who held the space for us all year. And so my experience in that was that through discernment, I discovered that, you know, I was definitely deeply committed to following through on some of the some of the invitations I felt were um, 
I, I was being drawn toward that were inviting me to a greater spiritual maturity. Um, and then I, I think one of the most moving parts of the experience for me was actually doing weekly spiritual reflection. It was really theological reflection, but we called it spiritual reflection just because theological is not a word that everyone is accustomed to or necessarily resonating with. And language is always a big thing in this work. But the experience of reflecting every week on, an ex on something that had happened in my life and then reporting that to my facilitator, having him read it and offer comments, and then going to my small group and being able to explore with them, here's, an, here's a spiritual insight from an experience in my life this week and where it's leading me, and then to hear from them what was happening in their lives in that realm was just something that I have never gotten to do before, despite three years of divinity school and being so involved in questions of spirituality and community. So I think it was really moving to create that kind of intimate environment for spiritual reflection and practice over time. Uh, it's so good. I, I wanted to see a little bit more at the end, like, do you feel as though you've been transformed? Is there something now that's kind of questioning or leading you to the next thing personally in terms of your own personal journey? But stay brief because we're, <laughs> we're in time. Okay. Um, yes is the answer. <laughs> um, and I think uh, it has to do with risking everything that I am and everything that I have on following the spirit of truth wherever it leads. That is so beautiful. Thank you. Woof, I'm, I'm touched. I'm very touched and moved. Thank you. Uh, and we, we want to hear uh, a little bit more now, uh, and I'm moving along quickly, but we want to hear a little bit more now about your present endeavor with Casper and Sue about the, uh, the new enterprise that you're starting, I believe, like tonight or today with meetings in Chicago, which was just launched last week, Sacred Designs. Would you, would you give us an, an overview of that? We'd, we'd so much appreciate it. Thank you. So we've just founded an organization called Sacred Design Lab, and the purpose of it is to help do what we can to foster a culture that is oriented around the soul. <laughs> um, and specifically these needs of the soul that you alluded to, Sue, of belonging, becoming, and beyond, which is basically just our translation of, of that connection um, to being deeply known and deeply loved, to growing into the people that we're called to be, and to experiencing ourselves as part of something more. Okay, and are you, where are you taking this? How are you going to, who are you going to do this for? So we're working with organizations across sectors. So we're working with organizations in education, technology, um, civic life and government, healthcare, as well as religious institutions and non, the nonprofit world. But basically with the premise that we um, were at a point when uh, the, the ways in which we are bereft in, as it relates to the needs of the soul is touching every sector of culture. And so there's a sense that the challenges are soul deep and so our response must be as well. You're going to go like into a, a university and talk about how, creating a culture in the university around belonging and, be, and becoming. You're going to go into a hospital, uh, a, a medical place. Is that, is that your hope? And you have a design for how to do that, how to, to make these, these, uh, commit, the commitment to community and to building up the, the institution and so on? Yes, well, it will surprise you not that the, the wisdom that we're drawing upon is ancient and it is not our own. <laughs> yes. But we're basically asking how, I, how might we apply the wisdom of our traditions to these emergent challenges that we're facing. That is correct. That, that's just awesome. Okay, the last question is, is there any way we can support you? Uh, uh, this is wonderful and, and we're, you know, we're moving now beyond our ability to do things but we have still hearts that are really yearning for the same things that you are. Well, I, I want to lift up again how absolutely essential and powerful it has been for our team to be accompanied by you, Sue, and by this group of sisters who has not just walked alongside us, but prayed over our efforts for years <laughs> and also like genuinely shared the riches of your experience in great detail over time. And there, I mean, there is no question that we would not be anywhere near where we are right now 
uh, without that. So I know that, you know, that is an example of personal relationships. And I think that's where it all happens <laughs> is in the context of relationship. Um, I imagine those listening have heard about the nuns and nuns conversation. And that's another one that it starts with relationship. So I think that's the biggest one. And then just to not, um, to, to be confident in the, the gifts that you're carrying um, and how needed they are. So that's part of what that relationship is about, is finding ways to, to share that. This is Stephanie Romiti. She's from the Sisters of St. Joseph of St. Uh, of Sault Ste. Marie, and uh, she'll present the question that she has for you. First of all, thank you so much for your generosity and sharing so openly with us. Um, and your enthusiasm is, is definitely contagious. <laughs> um, I am, I, I guess, in many ways, you've helped to articulate for me a lot of the direction that I feel more and more drawn even within my own ministries. Um, as an educator and as a spiritual director, I'm passionate about helping people, especially young adults, um, but people in all categories, to, to identify their deeper longings and yearnings. And um, one of the uh, articles I read, one of your panelists referred to um, three needs that she, I believe, said were often um, unconscious or, or not fully conscious. And she talked about, um, and, and you've been saying it in, in different words, really, um, you know, need to find meaning and purpose, the need to um, find relationship and community, and the need to make a difference. Okay. So with that little preamble, my question, I guess, would be, um, well, a little bit more, uh, a bit of a challenge sometimes that, that I face is being a sister um, and being therefore affiliated with the institutional church. Sometimes that can be a stumbling block for people um, until they get to know me or until, um, you know, some of those stereotypes can be broken down. So I guess the question would be this, what suggestions can you offer for connecting um, more personally with millennials in order to help to bring those um, deeper and often unconscious desires to a level of awareness. And then from there to be able to journey, um, to journey with them or to, to open doors of journeying with them. That makes sense. Yeah, that's a beautiful question. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, there was such a great moment in 2016 when I got to go to the first nuns and nuns gathering I had been part of at Harvard Divinity School. And one of these millennial change leaders um, was, you know, going on. And I think it was Carol Zinn who responded to him. I could be wrong. Um, but basically, this this young millennial activist type, you know, he said, ah, oh, all I want to do is transform myself in the context of community to serve the world. And Carol looks at him and says, my friend, that is what we call religious life. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and it was just this sort of moment of mind blown for this guy. And so I think, of course, Nuns and Nuns is just one effort, um, although I think it's a beautiful one and one that um, plenty of others could be part of. But really, it comes down to this, um, this work of coming alongside, which is to say, finding yourself in space, like you're saying, where you can actually develop a relationship that can start to break through those stereotypes that people have. And so I think one of the most fruitful places for that, that I've experienced just um, anecdotally from doing this work is amongst young people who are engaged actively in work towards social change. Because one of the most powerful I, um, discoveries I've seen them make has been about the, the, the notion of charism and the, and the way that charism lives um, in, 
in you know in various orders and in the way that that's been expressed over years and decades and in some cases it's over centuries um, and so I, I really see that as as a very fruitful point of potential connection is to 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 find avenues of engagement with young people who are doing social change work in the places, either the places that you live or that might align directly with the charism that you, you know, that you hold dear because um, I think there is a great need for the wisdom experience and accompaniment um, in these areas. And Sue mentioned that elder, elder pilot, quote unquote, but where, um, you know, basically just folks who had been doing things for longer and had cultivated wisdom um, as a result of both that work and their cultivated connection to spirit were able to accompany young leaders who just sometimes feel like no one's ever done it before, as crazy as that may sound. Um, so that can be not only reassuring, but it can honestly save, uh, it can save whole communities that otherwise would no longer um, be there because of the inexperience of their leadership. Thanks so much, Angie, and thank you, Stephanie. That was a good question. We're going to move now and uh, go to Mary McIntyre. She's from the Sisters of St. Joseph in Canada. And uh, Mary, would you continue our dialogue and uh, ask your question, please? Hi, Angie, thank you. I have the opposite uh, situation to Stephanie in that I do work at a university chaplaincy. And so I'm, I'm on campus quite a bit providing uh, spiritual direction uh, in an ongoing way and dropping spiritual direction. And so lots of the um, observations and experience that you've mentioned, I, I feel like I've um, experienced through the, the young adults that I have a lot of contact with. So it's an interesting parallel to hear your story, because of course, many of these young men and women are, are quite connected to the church, have chosen that uh, because they're living away from home. They don't have to, but they have chosen a connection. But they still have the same questions um, that seems like it's across the, the board for that age group. But um, it just, I don't know if it's a question, but it's just an observation that um, because I come at it from a connected faith community, uh, it seems that in some ways our, our, um, the questions are the same whether people are connected or not. And, and for young people, and I don't know if you know what I'm trying to say with that question, like some of these um issues for the young people uh that they're not they're not always addressed whether they're connected or not through uh, a church affiliation um that they're questions around life and uh and so I, I don't know if that makes sense as a question or a comment or you might have anything to to say about that well i would certainly affirm um that the the questions not only do they continue, but if anything, they're more acute. Um, because as we enter into this age of things like artificial intelligence and climate change and right, these like Gen Z is growing up with a world that has a lot of features that seem pretty cataclysmic or that they're so disruptive to um, what might have been conceived of as the status quo. And so the questions of what it means to be human and why we matter and where we're going are are, are they, they feel right at the surface. <laughs> um, and so I think that's some of at least where my conviction comes from around serving, you know, people kind of my age and younger is the sense that um, without spiritual resourcing, how will we possibly develop not only the resilience to face these experiences, but also the kind of creativity that comes from alignment with spirit. Thank you. Thanks, Mary, very much. I, I heard a definition of uh, relationships by some of the millennials, which was really striking for me. And uh, they, they told me that uh, relationships for them in general are for pleasure only. And uh, they said that puts a terrible strain on entering into a relationship simply because to get emotionally involved is to also know that both of us are free to leave at any time. <laughs> and to not get emotionally involved is then not to enter into and therefore not to experience the relationship. So very, very difficult. And I, th I think that some people struggle with that. How far can I go and feel safe? Uh, because they don't have other areas of belonging and they're longing for it so much. Let's continue though, it's not about this. Uh, I want to go on and ask uh, Christine Fernandez. She's from the Sisters of St. Joseph of Toronto. And Christine, have you got a question? Hi, um, Angie. 
Uh, nice to meet you. And it's been a very um, interesting and engaging conversation. I've been reading a lot of uh, the material uh, you have on your website, and you'll have some really great uh, reports, very inspiring and encouraging. Uh, one of the reports I read was uh, Faithful, which uh, you uh, directed towards religious institutions. And in that report, you talk about uh, the two types of work impro and improving versus creating. And you say improving requires learning new ways to do what we already know how to do. And creating requires learning new ways to do what we don't know yet how to do. So can you talk a little bit more about that and with a focus on what we can do to get involved in this evolutionary movement? Thank you for that question, Christine. Um, yes, and then this is, this is a, a premise that we learned from, from Gil Rendell, who's uh, been, it's kind of a Methodist thought leader that we've been inspired by, who co-wrote Faithful with us. Um, but the idea of, of improving versus creating, I think is an important one um, for this moment where, you know, it can feel as though um, if we basically that thing of if we just become excellent, then they'll come. <laughs> um, I think this is a lot of what can happen in the institutional forms of church life, for instance. Um, and the, it's just kind of this report was written to contend with the reality we're facing that often that kind of improving and, and aspiring for excellence at what we already do isn't aligned with the reality of what will um, serve these rising generations um, for a whole host of reasons that I think you probably know <laughs> I don't need to share. Um, but so that then leads us to this conundrum of creating, uh, which is so, you know, it feels like such a prayerful state to be because it is a grappling with mystery. It is an, a living in the presence of, okay, we are being asked to apply our creative energy to doing things we don't yet know how to do. <laughs> um, and that there's, I don't know, it just has this quality of a leap of faith involved in it, I think, um, that is coming, you know, we're kind of under duress and I'm right here with you in that place of like this whole moment feels like such a call to creativity. There are just legions of people who would be so served by the gifts of tradition and yet are, um, you know, are, kind of unavoidably apart from the way that those gifts have, gifts have been delivered in the past. And so what does it mean to apply, um, you know, our, <laughs> our bodies and our intellect and our spirit to that question? Um, and I think, you know, an effort like the Formation Project was one answer for us to say, okay, rather than just writing another report, we're just going to try something. We're just going to throw down and like do this audacious thing of trying to make a pilot that is um, drawing on, on many traditions and yet also somehow different and new at the same time. Um, and so I, I, have, I, I just wanna say that of all of the leaders and, and um, kind of all the people doing work in relationship to uh, religious institutions, my, my experience of sisters has been the most inspiring by far um, because of, I think it has, well, I could, I could, um, I could project some things as to why that might be, but I, either way, it's just been the case. <laughs> and I have experienced greater spiritual maturity and a willingness to contend with loss while also looking toward these hills with faith, I have experienced that more from sisters than anyone else that I've met doing this work. And so I think you are part of this evolutionary movement. And if you just believe that and act accordingly, <laughs> then we will be, we will be in good standing. Um, and, you know, we'll be together in facing whatever comes next. Angie, Stephanie, Mary, Christine, thank you. We have to close now, but uh, I just come back to the title of our little series, Currents of Hope and Grace. For what do we yearn? Angie, you're just like a living example of someone who is stretching out of this, these questions and, 
and this hope and this thrust of, of the young today. And the sister panelists, you are living examples of those who are yearning also whatever uh, aspect we're living in our lives, yearning to continue to serve and to lift up people to grow and to become and to uh, belong. So I, I want to just end uh, with, with enormous gratitude. We certainly missed Casper, but Angie, you were amazing. And we love you. I love you so much. So thank you very much. And thanks to each one of you sisters. Goodbye for now. Thank you so much. Sisters, I have certainly been touched by this interview and by our panelists, and I hope that you have been too. And I, uh, we can stop this afternoon by uh, taking a moment, perhaps just of quiet, to uh, reflect a little bit of how we've been spoken to today through the Spirit. And I wonder if it wouldn't be good if you decide you can do that, would be also to take a few minutes to share with one or two people around you. Uh, what is the involvement that you heard being introduced to us this afternoon? Involvement in this uh, openness to support young people who are searching so much and yearning so much for hope and grace. What, what are you involved with? How do you see yourself supporting young people today? How can we make this a part of our prayer and ministry? And you might be able to help each other to pick that up and to become enthused about this beautiful, beautiful group of young people who are so precious and who so much want to become good citizens and good children of God. Thanks so very much.